Welcome to the Road to Acapulco. There's a new idea in town, an idea that's been heralded by Bob Podolsky for 32 years. It's an idea that will change the world, and it's beginning to take shape in Acapulco. Hello, and welcome to the Road to Acapulco. This is edition 11, or yes, episode yes. 11. And this is Michael Nimitz, and I'm here with Bob Podolsky on a beautiful sunny day in Acapulco, Mexico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And today our topic is uh, one of the appendix, appendix in the book Flourish, Appendix D, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's titled Ethical Means and Ethical Ends. And what it talks about is something that's very interesting because a lot of people are doing unethical things, but they just don't quite know about it. And it's unfortunate, but it's these type of people that really have made our world a very bad place. And so you break this thing down into something you call sins. There's four <laughs> sins. Right. And there are four, the four types of sins, T1 right. through T4. Right. So can we go through each of those? Sure. Well, let's start with the T1s. They are the least the least uh, damaging to our society. These are instances where people harm others accidentally, where they have no idea they're gonna harm someone. And usually when they do that, and then realize afterward that they've harmed someone, they, they regret having harmed someone. They didn't set out to harm someone. They set out to do something that seemed perfectly okay, but it wound up being harmful. It was an accidental sin, so to speak. And these are obviously among the least damaging because they only happen accidentally, never with intent. So if someone's driving their car and, and they spill coffee on their lap or something like that and run into the guy yeah. in front of them. Or they the tire blows out and uh, they have an accident that harms someone else. Same thing. Uh, one could say, gee, uh, the guy whose tire blew out, uh, if he'd been more responsible, he would have seen to it that he had four good tires. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there might have been something on the road that he couldn't anticipate that punctured the tire, and it was completely outside of his control. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't see it, didn't have a chance to avoid it. Nonetheless, he hurt someone, totally by accident. So then in the book, you go to the, the, the type three. Actually, I go to type four next. Oh, okay, type, type four. Type four is the opposite. Type four is an act by someone who knowingly hurts others, either for, per, for personal gain, uh, like a mugger who shoots his victim and robs him, or who simply enjoys inflicting pain. There are sadists, sadists out there uh, who will consistently uh, inflict pain on others because it gives them a perverse pleasure. Those are the type four sins, if you will. Then there's type three. Now type three is instances where uh, you might have, for example, a doctor is going to inflict pain on a patient well, the patient needs a tracheotomy, and if he doesn't have one, in two minutes he'll be dead for lack of the ability to breathe. Well, making a hole in somebody's throat could be construed as inflicting injury and therefore some kind of an unethical, sinful act, but the practitioner has to choose between am I going to puncture this guy's throat or let him die? And so it is with a certain regret that the doctor will say, okay, I've got to make a hole in your throat. Sorry, bud. And he goes ahead and saves the guy's life. Mm -hmm. None of those three types, one, three, and four, uh, none of those is a big social or societal problem. They are self-limiting, self-correcting. People do these things not wanting to hurt anyone. It's the type two, however. Well, the type four does want to hurt. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, yeah, Type 4, but the thing with the Type 4 people is that they're readily recognizable and they don't usually 
remain at large in the public for very long. They are recognized and they are either incarcerated or executed uh, or otherwise uh, limited in their ability to inflict harm. Unless they're a politician. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Uh, I agree with you, there are politicians like that. Um, you see more voluntary harm being done by psychopaths than by any other group. The tricky part is the type 2s. And the type 2 is the, 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 the type 2 sin is an act that harms someone where the person who does the harm has no sense of ethics or little sense of ethics. They have not been taught anything about ethics, and they don't know they're hurting, hurting someone. Let's say, for example, you've got the clerk in a courthouse, or maybe a, an assistant clerk in a courthouse. And this is a person that if you have to file papers with the court, you go in, you see them through a window. Usually these days it's a bulletproof window because uh, uh, folks in courthouses aren't very popular. <laughs> and if they didn't protect themselves, they'd likely get shot. But you go in and you hand some paperwork to a junior clerk in a courthouse, that person is committing a type 2 sin. They don't know it. They don't know that enforcing rules where uh, innocent people are innocent being people, harmed. Exactly. Innocent people are being harmed. They've not done anything wrong, but some legislator, who might have been a type 4, <laughs> he wrote down some rules that are being enforced and people are being fined for doing things that didn't harm anyone. So these people might be considered enablers in yeah. a codependent relationship. Yes, that's true. The, the type 4 is basically utilizing the type 2s yes. as, their, as their enablers. Right, and infrequently the people who engage in type 2 sins are obedient folk. They obey the laws, even when the laws are highly unethical. They engage in highly unethical acts, but they are good boys and girls, or at least that's where they're coming from. They're being good boys and girls. As grown-ups, they become slaves to the psychopaths and the psychopaths don't care how many people they hurt. They've been known to hurt hundreds of millions of people. Mm -hmm. So the type 2 sins are very special. And the reason I say they're special is because they get institutionalized. That the rules by which they do the things they do are written down on paper and approved of by the so-called legislators. They make the rules that enable agencies, for example, to develop regulations that are plundering, the, literally plundering the public. Today, so in, in most cases, these are these are all type two people. They all right. They just believing that they're mm -hmm. doing the right thing. That's right. While essentially enabling the unethical things. That right. That's take what. Place. That's what I maintain is in terms of who's doing what in our society, it's that kind of behavior by those kind of people that I see as the most dangerous. Because the other three kinds are less likely to propagate, less likely to become institutionalized, less likely to be written down so that more and more people are following those rules. And it's for the most part, those people who've done that who are getting away with doing terrible things to the rest of us, mainly out of ignorance. They've gotten rewarded for doing these terrible things, and because there are pieces of paper that say it's okay, they believe it, they think it's okay. You know, it's like the, the guards at Auschwitz. Oh, we're just doing our job. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, that's police, teachers, Administrators, lots of people, legislators. Yes, they're all in that same boat. All working for government. I think the legislators sometimes are aware that they are bandits, that they are plundering the public, and they are psychopathic enough not to care. 
I don't know. I think a lot of, I mean, having some experience with politics, I tend to believe that most politicians are people that have dirt on them. Mm. So they're kind of in a position where they're, if they move backward, they get the cattle prod. <laughs> and, and as long right. as they keep doing what the master tells them to do to some degree, they, you know, they're okay. So they're kind of in the slave mode too. Yes. I think. To some to degree. degree. The, the legislatures are owned and operated by the big moneyed interests. So yeah, the politicians are members of the slave class, but there's a higher percentage of them that are psychopaths than if you look at the lower levels. You look at the people who are enforcing the laws, they are somewhat psychopathic too, but it's not as extreme and there aren't as many. Yeah. Although I do believe that in the law enforcement field, the percentage of psychopaths is increasing and has increased dramatically over the last 10 years. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, our, our media is also kind of promoting that behavior. Some of the mm -hmm. movies these days are kind of glorifying, torturing people for the information so that you can get the, you know, where's the bomb? Tell me, or I'm going to blow your head off or mm -hmm. something like that, you know. Right. <clears throat> so... To, to a large degree, our society is becoming more psychopathic, and it's probably mm -hmm. got to do with the fact that they're utilizing the type twos to kind of create this atmosphere that it's almost okay to be a type four. Right, right. Well, obviously, to the type four people, that is people who regularly engage in the type four sins, uh, it is okay with that. They like who they are. They don't have any uh, guilt. They don't have any remorse. They have no empathy. Uh, these are people who are totally narcissistically self self uh, uh, engaged, and, and they have no regard whatever for other people. Although they can be very good at pretending, very good at pretending to be involved. So. In regard to the average person, the average person that pays their taxes and, and does their job, are they also a type two? I think that what they're doing in supporting these evil deeds constitutes type two sins. That if I am, if I am paying taxes to support the, these law enforcers, if I am paying taxes to support legislators, if I am voting for anyone in, for political office, uh, I am then enabling and supporting these type two sins. And they are the most widespread and in my opinion the most dangerous of, of all of the uh, so-called sins. So then uh, does, does a, a libertarian fall into the, the sin category? So the, the only people that are without sin then are the anarchists. Is that? Well, I think that that is a conclusion that one could rationally defend. Uh, I don't know all the politicians and so I cannot really make a universal statement about them. Uh, I do believe that people who want power over others are generally committing type four sins, uh, acts which are unethical and they don't care. Now for the people who are the administrators beneath them, they may or may not be aware. Uh, the ones that are aware are probably the more ambitious ones who aspire to become judges and lawyers, judges and legislators. And those are dangerous folks. Well, I guess I should back up. The anarchists, they probably end up having to pay some type of taxes. They've got gasoline taxes yep. and licenses for their vehicles and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I guess they're more type three, where they understand that they're just trying to do as little harm as they can right. to Right. perpetuate their own lives. There are two kinds of laws that are, in my opinion, 
and I have good reason for having this opinion, that the two kinds of laws that are particularly, particularly damaging to society, those laws which forbid us to do things that are ethical, like operating a lemonade stand, giving food to the homeless, and so on. Uh, there are laws that forbid good acts, and there are those that require us to do evil things. Okay? Uh, those are a little harder to, to recognize, but if we are required to pay to have a sizable number of people equipped with military weapons, and we're to pay for them to fly halfway around the world to shoot strangers, uh, <laughs> I would say that uh, paying those taxes is doing something evil. You're supporting really evil actions. And that, again, that comes down to uh, you might realize that you're doing that and be afraid not to. Yeah. Uh, where do, which camp does that put your actions in? Well, you know that they're evil and you're afraid not to obey the law. And so you choose to obey the law out of fear. You're being coerced. If you're being coerced, then you're, in a sense, you're not a moral agent. You're not actually choosing on a conscious you're, level. You're under duress. Exactly. You're under duress. So the bottom line is, is as long as we have government, there's, we're, we're all sinners yeah, most. by these definitions maybe there's, yeah. maybe there's a few people that escape that that right that live on the very fringes of our society and, and right and and life is difficult for for such people i know a few they are not registered anywhere they don't they don't have uh, uh cars with license plates they uh, uh probably they, don't have cars then. well some of them do some of them don't <laughs> And the ones that do, and who actually drive their cars, are frequently uh, stopped by police and uh, abused. I can only call it abused. I've actually witnessed one of them who got beaten and tased, handcuffed, and taken away to a cage. Because, well, he, he actually had valid license plates on his vehicle. It was, a, it was a wholly different set of circumstances, but he hadn't done anything to anyone. And uh, yet, he was treated that way yeah. because, actually, in his case, someone out of the blue, a stranger, attacked him in a shopping center. <laughs> and the owner of the shopping center, or someone who worked for the shopping center, reported it to the police. And after he chased away the guy that, that had attacked him, then the police came and... Attacked him. Attacked him, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It was horrible. But a typical example, though, of the brutality of the bandits that are out there on the road. Uh, and, and, and the examples of that kind of behavior are more and more numerous. They're very common now. It's very common. If you go online, uh, there's a website, uh, Free Thought Project, I think it is. Oh, there's cop block. I know there's cop block also, and and these are these are things that are happening all the time now, and the cops are getting away with it. Yeah. They are beating people for no reason, tasing them for no reason, pepper spraying them for no reason, and killing them literally, killing people for no reason, and getting away with it. And mm -hmm. that is <laughs> that is certainly uh, the result of a lot of T fours. In other words, these are people who. If you ask them, is it okay to commit murder, they will say, no, that's not allowed. That's bad. And yet, they'll go commit murder, knowing that it's bad. They don't care. Yeah. Yeah, and there's much more than just the police mm -hmm. uh, shooting and killing people. It's also that they, they also, being that they are the enforcers of the law, in a lot of cases, the police work with the criminals right or have a little side deal with criminals where you know you hit this house that's empty i'll look the other way you get the loot go you know uh cash it out and i'll take you know right 25 percent or whatever right right there's so a lot of all, that. all these kind of things are going on 
underneath the system and it's all because of the police i think there was a Mm -hmm. particular town that you know they shut down their police force crime went down crime rate went down by like 90 percent right (laughs) right i think that's a good example i think that that is i i think that the presence of bandits with badges i call them I think that their presence is one of the biggest sources of evil deeds on the planet. Well, it's it's interesting here in Mexico, uh, in regard to that, the the average person, the average Mexican, looks at a at a police officer as corrupt. Just assumes right. that right off the bat, that cop is corrupt. Right, working for somebody else, not. For my, not for me, certainly, right. but for some other interest, mm-hmm. and so I think that is a very healthy uh, point of view. Yes, I agree with that. That's part of why I'm really enjoying being here, is because I recognize that. And uh, if I were driving around town now, which I haven't had to do since I've been here, I've gotten rides everywhere I wanted to go. But if I were driving around, I wouldn't carry a driver's license. No. In fact, when I go around town as a passenger I don't carry a driver's license and I don't worry about it I I think nothing of it and if I were driving around town and a police signaled me to pull over I'd probably just go around the cop and and go on my merry way yeah well we've certainly got uh, examples of people that do that all the time yeah and yeah almost have an enjoyable time about it It have almost got to the point that they they look forward to those things because it's always a fun story to tell later on. <laughs> right, and it's a great reminder of what they've gotten away from in the States. Yeah. Because it doesn't, it isn't like that here. That doesn't mean that, that cops here are not corrupt. The, the, the average Joe on the street is probably perfectly aware that the cops are corrupt. But they also are aware that they can ignore them most of the time. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's an interesting thing. So getting back to the book, uh, the next section is is titled "Defining the Good Act," mm. and we're talking about two different types of of ethic or definitions of ethics, mm-hmm. and you label them as E one and E two. Right. So e one, an ethical act is one that benefits at least one person while harming no one. Right. While ethic two is, an ethical act is one that causes more benefits to people than it does harm. Mm -hmm. That's the utilitarian ethic, Okay, by definition. So one of these is good, and one of these is bad. That's right. That's right. And, And it's pretty simple to understand that. Let's say I commit an act, and... Some people benefit from it, and some people are harmed by it. Now, after the act is completed, an independent observer sees the the people I've affected. And let's say one person has benefited, another one has been harmed. Does the person observing this know that there was only one act involved? No. To them, it's the logical equivalent of two separate acts. One act was an ethical act that helped someone. The other was an unethical act that harmed someone. Oh, from this we can get that an act that does both includes or is logically equivalent to an act that harmed someone. Because if you take those two acts together, one is harmed, the other is not. Oh, so the conclusion I draw is that an act that says this is okay, I mean, an ethic that says this is okay, is basically saying it's okay to harm people. Well, I don't agree with that at all. I believe an ethical act is one which increases truth, awareness, love, or creativity for at least one person, including the person acting, without limiting or diminishing any of these resources for anyone. Because if it did limit or diminish one of these resources for anyone, then the act would be equivalent to 
an act that does both. It helps someone and it harms someone. And an act that harms someone is unethical by definition. So I don't go along with the utilitarian ethic at all. And yet it is the ethic that is used to justify government mm -hmm. for most people. Most people say, oh well, we got less, less bad stuff going on this way than we would without government. And of course they have no proof of that. There's no evidence of that. And if anything, the evidence shows the opposite. That in the absence of government, that people are much more likely to thrive and flourish than they are in the presence of government. The whole notion that government is good for the public is a lie. So uh, then going beyond the, that section, then we've got uh, what you titled the historic proof. Hmm. Okay. And the first part is values and beliefs. And in that you have a example of a plant and its value is sunlight. Mm -hmm. And its belief is turning towards the sunlight will Benefit. give it more right. without harming anyone else. Right. right. I, so even a plant has a built-in ethic in that sense that plants look to better their condition, they will compete, and the one with bigger leaves that are positioned closer to the sun and are more uh, perpendicular to the rays of the sun is, is the one that's going to win the competition. And evolution has favored such behavior. And so most plants today, not all of them, but most of them, actually respond to the sunlight with that level of awareness. We're good. So, in regard to the the plants, right. similarly, if we can look at our own behavior, what we what we value, uh, we can if we have a, a valid belief, then we will get the thing more we of value. what we want. Right. Versus if we have an invalid belief, we essentially end up putting ourselves in the position of a plant that doesn't get sunlight uh -huh. or, or turns away from the sunlight mm -hmm. and dies. Right, right. It's really important in order to have an optimum life as an individual. It's important that we adopt an ethic that is valid because otherwise we're dooming ourselves to, to a life of failure and frustration. If I have a belief system that keeps me doing something that doesn't work and I keep that belief system, that is what Einstein calls insanity. Uh, you keep doing what doesn't work thinking you're going to get a different result. And, and so how this kind of relates to the Octolog is that because we have the opportunity to now kind of bounce off other people, our beliefs, mm -hmm and get some feedback about what our actual beliefs are versus the values that we have that we want more of, mm -hmm. that we start to really get better at getting what we want with a much more effective belief. Right, exactly, exactly. And, and a big piece of that is that the Octolog provides a very reliable means of feedback to let us know uh, how our behavior can be seen in other ways than those that are already familiar to us. So if I do something that is comfortable and familiar and seven other people say, oh my gosh, you are doing something damaging to those around you, we don't want you doing that to us, suddenly I've got a whole different perspective on myself. That's valuable. That's incredibly valuable because that change in perspective might be the very thing that takes me from a life of loneliness and isolation to a life of belonging to a society that is operating ethically. Wow, that's really important stuff. So I right, recommend so, it. So there are, there are a lot of harmful harmful beliefs that we have in our society of many, things many, that many. are going on. Like for example, the uh, you know, the, a lot of the prescription drugs. Oh God, are, yes. 
that are being prescribed and, right. and essentially people are under the impression that these things are good for them or good for them for the for the time being mm -hmm. but the the bottom line is is they're they're putting themselves in harm's way or they're putting other people in harm's right. way because of the side effects and the other things that can react with the drugs right to cause other things that will harm people right or the very idea that one should always trust one's doctor okay this is a commonly uh, promoted idea but it's a harmful idea because doctors make mistakes all the time and they are financially rewarded for some of their mistakes I'd call that corruption they call it professional ethics <laughs> Duh. ethics my goodness they don't know what ethics are well, and that's that's uh, another thing that that a lot of people struggle with is the definition of an ethic. It is such a clouded word in today's understanding for most people. But it isn't that it really isn't that difficult. A lot of people understand it at some basic level. Right. Even you know we we mentioned in an earlier podcast the movie nine to five right and in that movie the boss you know they kidnap the boss and while he's away they start making positive changes mm -hmm. ethical changes to the workplace right that result in a much more productive workplace and so all those people recognize that the management was becoming more ethical and because of that, they had a higher level of trust and, a, and a more, were more apt right. to be more productive. And in that movie, the boss consistently acted unethically. And so their behavior in stopping him from doing that could be construed as self-defense. <laughs> I thought seriously about that because kidnapping your boss is not something you would normally <laughs> think is an ethical act. But if that boss makes the lives of 500 people in his office place miserable because he's doing unethical stuff, it might very well be ethical to interrupt that, even temporarily, to make some changes. And that's what is depicted in that movie. Well, uh, I guess this could be considered, uh, uh, you know, the idea that Robin Hood, for example, you steal from the rich and give to the poor that is that that's still considered unethical isn't it it is unless it's for restitution and this is an argument that i've heard that i actually think is pretty good ar argument that if you're stealing from the rich who got that way by stealing from the poor and you're giving back to the poor what you steal from the rich that would be ethical that's restitution but that's not how it's usually described, it's usually described as simply steal from the rich, give to the poor, which in and of itself is unethical. Mm -hmm. So this is a good example of something that I have uh, preached for a long time. And that is simply the notion that we never know all of the facts surrounding a decision. So, for example, if someone tells me they're going to steal from one group of people and give the proceeds to another group of people and they ask me would that be ethical my at first blush I'd probably say well gee that doesn't sound ethical to me then they provide me additional information well all the money we're stealing was stolen from us we're just giving it back oh well now it is ethical what do you know <laughs> there could be some other set of circumstances that would make it unethical again we never have all the information that, is, that surrounds an event or a decision. Therefore, we always have to be a little suspicious of our own decisions. We have to question not only what other people are doing, we have to question what we are doing. And then, given all of the facts at our disposal and all of the knowledge of ethics that we have, we make the best decision we can and hope for the best. So in the circumstances where a octologue would exist in mm -hmm. the place of Robin Hood mm -hmm. and the, the, the eight people had to decide 
is it ethical for us to steal from the rich mm -hmm. and and give to the poor? Uh, that would be an interesting that would be an interesting discussion to say the it least. It would indeed, and of course we know ahead of time that there were there are that if you put the question just that way, you are lacking a lot of information. So people in the octologue, being intelligent beings, otherwise you know they probably wouldn't be in an octologue, but being reasonably intelligent, they're going to be asking these questions. Well, where did these rich people get their money? What did they do to us? Can we identify the victims? Can we give back the money that they stole or defrauded us out of? And do, if so, do we have receipts of that? Do we have a record? Do we have a proof that that was that actual that money was actually ours, or right? Theirs? Exactly. How, how do how do we make those decisions? And so, there's a lot of discussion could go into that. And I'm guessing that the outcome would be that we would decide there are some rich people for whom that would be an appropriate response, and some not. The ones who made their riches by providing the public with better products at better prices, those people deserve what they, the, the wealth that they have. Whereas the ones who have literally defrauded those around them, the bandits and, and crooks, uh, yeah, that would be good to uh, take away what they've got, give it back to the people they stole it from. Well, I think, uh, you know, if I was in that octologue, I would have a problem with uh, the stealing part, the actual theft, even though it was from somebody that had stole it, mm. stealing it from them is, it, it represents to me a level of principle that I'm just not... Well, what do you mean when you use the word stealing in that context? To me... Well, breaking if, into their home or breaking into their well, property. One one way to go about it, of course, would be to confront them on some level and say, we are aware that you have uh, stolen goods, stolen wealth that you are hoarding and that you have that doesn't really belong to you. It belongs to other people. Are you willing to give it back? And if they're not willing to give it back, then the question is, well, what do you do about that? You know. And I would not call retrieving that wealth stealing. It would be against their wishes that you take it away from them, but to me that doesn't make it stealing. What makes it stealing is if, they, if it actually belonged to them, if they had a right to it and you took it away, that would be stealing. But in fact, you're taking away from, some, from them something that doesn't really belong to them. Well, let's say for example, it was like you had some level of proof that right. what they had taken was was yours or was theirs, the poor people. I can give examples uh, of that. Then you could essentially right. hire a collection agency then. Well, how would the collection agency function? Is, so, is there at some point the recourse of, okay, you've refused all opportunities to make restitution, now the restitution is going to happen whether you like it or not. How do you do that? I don't know. Well, that's something but, I mean, that that's a whole amount could decide. Exactly. I don't there might be a creative solution to yeah, this. Yeah, I don't pretend to have us. I don't pretend to have all the answers to, to such things, but I do believe that an octologue or a group of octologues is far better equipped to make such decisions than I am individually. Yeah. And that's that's where you get into not just using one mind, but using eight minds in combination. Right with all their knowledge and experience right. and all their connections and all their creativity and all their creativity to come up with a solution that one person might never come right. to the conclusion of right. might think their entire life and never have the experiences and understanding and connections with other people right. that eight people represent mm -hmm. and so that being the optimum creative atmosphere mm -hmm would probably be the best opportunity to come up with a creative solution to that problem. I would expect so. So, with that said, let's <laughs> let's wrap this up with one last thing and that was in this you talk about the golden rule. Oh yeah. And you know how many people love the golden rule. Oh yes, it's uh you're going to burn <laughs> that one down too. Yeah, right so. Right so. Here here's the thing. 
Uh, there are a sizable number of people in our society, uh, we humans, uh, at least 20% of humans, maybe more, have a strong trace, if you will, of sadomasochism in their character structure. And everyone has some character structure, and people who, whose character structure is sadomasochistic, when it's particularly extreme, they like to inflict pain, they also like to have pain inflicted on them. They actually become sexually aroused frequently when they are experiencing pain. It seems perverse. But there's a sizable percentage of the population like that. Now what's going to happen if you meet such a person and they're obeying the golden rule? Well, the golden rule is treat others as you want them to treat you. So you meet someone who wants you to beat him. What's he going to do to you? He's going to beat you. What do you know? He's going to follow <laughs> the golden rule and do to you what he wants you to do to him. I don't like that. And I don't think you would either. My point is that the golden rule does not account for the presence of sadomasochists. And yet they're real. Yeah. They really are out there. And you'd be amazed how, how many people fit the bill of the sadomasochist to some degree. Again, it's not, not, everyone, is, not everyone who has sadomastic traits is, is a pure sadomasochist. They, those are very rare, actually, the really pure ones. But they do exist, and you don't want to meet them on the, on the, on the basis of the golden rule. Okay? Well, well, I think, actually, there's a lot more masochists. There could be. Than, than what, 20%. You're, what you're saying. I think yeah. most people have some type of mas masochistic behavior that you know, may not be inherent in their personality, but is part of society's acceptance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of what people do, which is essentially to take punishment from the authorities. Right, and, and yet the whole idea of punishment as a response to anything <laughs> is, is bogus. Okay, you cannot make an ethical society by punishing everyone. Uh, it, it, it's never going to work. Punishment is a very, very poor way of manipulating behaviors. Uh, restitution is not punishment. It's giving back to someone who lost something what they lost. Uh, punishment, throwing people in jail, how does that equip them in any way, shape, or form to be better members of society? I don't think it does so at all. I think certainly not with the system in place in the United States. Exactly, exactly. Now, I think Japan comes closer to uh, a decent solution because they do place more emphasis on restitution than we do in the States. So I, I, I'll give, it, give them that, that the Japanese system is more humane in dealing with crime, on the whole. Yeah, I, whole. I think uh, Norway actually has a, a somewhat similar... Uh, kind of penal system where they, you know, are trying to, you know, knock down the recidivism to a, you know, much lower level. It's like one in ten of their prisoners mm. actually end up returning to prison, where I think it's like four out of five in the United States mm -hmm. is returning mm -hmm. to prison. Right, that makes a lot of sense to me. So I, I definitely approve of systems where uh, punishment is minimized and restitution is maximized. Uh, I, I, I see that as much more ethical. The real problems in terms of penal systems, uh, and, and penal of course means punishment, so I, I, I almost cringe when I use the word, but the real problem is how you deal with psychopaths because you can't cure them you cannot change them. Frequently when they are recognized for their psychopathy in the penal system, they get transferred to a mental hospital. And yes, it's likely to be a high security uh, setting in a mental hospital for a while, but 
the mental hospital system does not recognize psychopathy as a mental illness. <laughs> if you look at the DSM, of all the mental illnesses, right, it's, that the, they it's the one that's most there. damaging and most dangerous, <laughs> they don't recognize it as a mental illness. I say that it's because the industry, the mental health industry, is largely run by psychopaths. And so they make the rules and definitions. That's certainly an interesting uh, point, Bob, and I would love to fact check that one. Okay, but there's a book on it. Is it really? The book is by R.D. Lang, L-A-I-N-G, Lang. Uh, he's a, I don't doubt he's alive still, but he was a British psychiatrist, and he was schizophrenic. Hmm. And so he's one of these few people who is schizophrenic and a high achiever. Uh, a bit like uh, John Nash, who was depicted in the movie A Beautiful Mind. Uh, toward, at the end of the movie, he's going around doing his business as a creative mathematician, and the people that he was hallucinating the presence of are still there. He sees them, they follow him around, but he ignores them. And because he's no longer interacting with them or believing anything they're trying to tell him, he's leaving, leading a fairly normal life and becomes an, a Nobel Prize winning mathematician. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> that's great. Uh, and to some degree, we can all do that sort of thing. But when it comes to the psychopath, uh, the people who run the mental hospitals are sufficiently psychopathic themselves that they basically have refused to call psychopathy a mental illness. And because of that, what happens when a psychopath is put in, a, in, a, in such a hospital, usually after a certain period of time, uh, the psychopath conforms to the desired norm, is very well behaved, acts like a good boy or a good girl, they're more males than females, and uh, convinces the authorities to let him go. And then the next thing, they go and repeat the behavior that got him jailed in the first place. And they, this sometimes this happens again and again. There is a book on this subject. It is called The Mask of Sanity. Very good book, and you can download, download a version of it for free on the internet. The Mask of Sanity. But coming back to R.D. Lang, he described in, in minute detail the environmental conditions under which people become schizophrenic. And he describes his own life and how his upbringing influenced him in that way, a very adverse way. And uh, he also points out that most of the psychiatrists and mental health workers in hospitals uh, who decide what, what are the mental health diagnoses of their patients, most of them attribute to their patients characteristics that they themselves have. So, <laughs> if they are uh, damaging people, they will see their patients as damaging to people, and they will abuse them, reenacting some of the abuse that they themselves experienced as children. Hmm. So, R.D. Lang does a great job of describing that and how it affected his life, and how he believes uh, schizophrenia is a natural defensive modality for people that have certain kinds of childhood experience. Hmm. Uh, so it's a very interesting book. It's called The Politics of Experience, R.D. Lang. Interesting. So going back to the, the penal situation, I, I think I wanted to just ask a question in regard to that. Is there a ethical role for a prison? Is that, is that something that we could see in the, Very good in the question. holomatic? Well, consider this. How is a prison supported? Is it supported by taxes? Well, are taxes ethical? Currently, yes. That's, or, that's the way most they're prisons legal, are supported. They're legal, but they're not ethical. Taxation, but for a society that was trying to keep harmful people from 
stealing their stuff, mm -hmm. I'm sure that everybody would pay a small amount. Yes, we could support prisons by subscription, where people who want to support them, support them. Now, in that case, if there were sufficient support of that sort... Or, or maybe an insurance company. An insurance company would certainly want the people that are risking their clients. Well, if, let's see, if you buy insurance against crime, crime insurance, then the insurance company has a vested interest in limiting crime because yeah. more crime, they pay out more. Yeah. So they want to limit it. So they could run a prison. You'd be paying for it in your insurance premiums, Yes. in effect. I don't see a problem with that in and of itself, I don't. But then who would... Who yeah, who would make the decisions? I think that there are a number of different ways that such decisions can be made, and I would like to see an, uh, an octologue or two address that question and come up with some creative answers. I have some ideas about that, sufficient that I could participate in such an octologue, but I... <laughs> That's someone I know. I'll have to call her back. Anyway, uh, participating in an octologue. Yeah, I, I could see participating in an octologue that addresses that kind of challenge, but I don't see myself uh, competent to to come up with a, an answer on my own. Again, it's a, it's a problem that I am confident can be solved, but it's not one that I would trust to any one individual, or maybe not even to a small committee. You know, uh, Maybe that's something that a whole group of octologues would work on together, or in parallel, and then combine the results to come up with the best answer. Mm -hmm. Where it gets really interesting is in the case of where the criminals are psychopaths, the question becomes, what are you going to do? You're going to support those people? And at what level are you going to support them? So, the question is then, how much support are we willing to pay for these prisoners? Right now, keeping a prisoner in a prison, on average, if you, if you look at the average across the country, across the states, you're looking at $50,000 a year to support a prisoner. And they have gymnasiums, and they have television, and they have libraries, and they get health care, and they have all kinds of perks that a lot of people not in prisons would love to have. Mm. And I think that before supporting prisons, we ought to have one or several octologues, maybe a bunch of them, uh, deciding just exactly what is our obligation as citizens to support people who have been habitual criminals, especially the ones who are uh, incapable of changing, that is the psychopaths. The, the question is very relevant is, well, how much are we going to give them to keep them from preying on us? Well, I think for a lar the large part, the business enterprises, the, the insurance companies would be the ones that actually make those decisions because it's really the risk that they're insuring against. So for a large part, I think that you would have, you know, more than likely an octologue or a hollow mat of octologues that deal with that particular issue in right. the most efficient manner. I think that would be true. Assuming that uh, insurance companies are run that way, I think that would be a very good way to, to, to make those decisions. I think it would be very mm, important from an ethical standpoint for the insurance company, holomatic or otherwise, to be aware that it is ultimately their customers who are paying their premiums yes. who are paying for the prisons. Yes. And given that that's so, there is a question of if someone is going to be unwilling to change, like a psychopath, and we can, we can determine who's a psychopath, that's, that's a doable proposition. Once you determine someone is psychopathic and isn't going to change, what level do you support them at? 
Uh, well, is, the, the, the thing is, is that what we envision as prisons today might be completely different in true. the future if they're looking true. at what's the most efficient way to keep people from being, you know, a burden to this burden to our society. Well, here's they might a, just mm -hmm. let them play video games all day, <laughs> and you know that would be enough. You know, just have them at home arrest or you know, yeah. uh, uh, house arrest. That's let them doable. play video games. That maybe vi maybe there's video games that they can actually function as some sort of beneficial mm. uh, member of society, yet be involved in that okay. all their waking time. Here's another possibility, and that is that we set aside some geographic region. Let's take, for example, the city of Washington D.C. Okay, it would be a good one. And we put around it an, an inescapable barrier of some kind. Now, I don't know what technology it would take to keep the prisoners inside that, that region, but let's imagine that somewhere there's a holomat creative enough to actually create an, an environment from which there is no escape. And so, when someone is proven to be uh, a psychopath who is dangerous to those around him and who's absolutely not going to change, we give them a backpack with a few days rations, a knife, some matches, maybe a little hatchet, and we turn them loose in that region. I think DC would be a great place to do it. And we say goodbye, and that's it, the end of it. And they're there with the other psychopaths, and they will do whatever the hell they please, but we're not paying much to keep them there because the system is just one enclosure with a really high-tech means of keeping people in. No way for them to get out. We have things in place so that they cannot be flown out. They cannot be rescued by helicopter and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we have one very secure, limited area and they survive or they don't, and it's none of our business. They deal with each other. The only, the only victims available to them are other psychopaths. I think that would be a beautiful way to deal with this, but we don't have that technology in place yet, and we don't have the public awareness yet to put it in place. That doesn't mean it can never happen, though. Well, until I then... Would, I, would let, I would think that uh, octologues... Uh, and a group of people with an ethical purpose could probably come up with something that we can't even envision. Probably. But I think it's much more creative. Yeah. And, uh, I'm not making that decision. I'm just saying that there probably is a way to exile the psychopaths. It might look like what I described. It might look like something completely different that I can't even imagine. I don't care what it is, but I want to minimize the public expenditure on supporting psychopaths. And who knows, maybe someday we'll find a way to cure them of their psychopathy without lobotomizing them, hopefully. You know, the, there is a movie on that subject, by the way. Uh, it was called, let's see, what was it called? Uh, it was a British film. Clockwork Orange. Oh, okay. Okay. That was a case of someone who basically had his brain modified in order to keep him in line. Uh, I suppose that's probably more humane than killing people. If you can change their mind uh, and make them harmless, uh, that's probably a more ethical thing to do. It might be less ethical than exile, but less expensive also. Yeah. Uh, but the well, other you could, alternative, you know, of you course, could essentially give them a choice. Then at that point, you could true. give them the choice of right. surgically removing their <laughs> psychopathy or or death, letting them fend for themselves in an island of death. There you go, there you go. <laughs> so there's a number of things that could be done, and I leave it to other people to figure that out. But I, I do, I do believe that the most dangerous breaches of ethics that we have today are those that are institutionalized. And I do believe that most people don't realize that, and if they did, those problems would go away. Yeah. Again, it's a matter of education and cultural evolution. 
Yeah, so in, in conclusion, uh, zooming out to the big picture, based on the information that you've brought to us, most people are effectively sinning because of the circumstances of the in institutionalized unethical behavior. Right. That practically everyone is somehow involved in this. Right. And really the only way out of this circumstance in this in this really kind of box that we're in is getting rid of government. Right. And becoming more responsible and creative. Getting rid of hierarchy generally. It goes a little beyond government. It means getting hierarchies out of corporations, getting hierarchies out of every kind of institution. Uh, I think that just just doing away with hierarchic government it will be a big step, but in and of itself, maybe not sufficient. Where well, when you when you grasp the idea that that the the decisions will be ethical, mm -hmm. and when people start to understand that that's that's not that great of a leap to do but that they can work with their friends and neighbors to get that done. Right. It almost becomes obsolete. The right. the hierarchy becomes obsolete. Exactly. It just isn't as efficient. It doesn't make people as creative as the octolog does. Exactly. And therefore it just can't compete. Right. And right. so it will just die on the vine just right. like the plant that turns away from the sunlight is going to die. It's going to die where the plant that turns toward the sunlight is going to live. Right. And that's what the octolog really represents. Thank you. A I like better that. belief system. Yep. Well, I think we'll end on that note. This has been very helpful to me to help me to clarify my thinking on these subjects. And I thank you for meeting with me and for doing this podcasting that we're doing. I'm, I'm having fun with it, and I'm hoping our listeners are too. Please let us hear from you. Uh, you can email me, Boris Ayer, B O R I S H E I R, at yahoo.com. Uh, you can even call me up on the phone, 561 542 5800. I'm open to receiving phone calls. And I'll be happy to talk with you if you have questions. So let's keep it together. Let's keep doing the Octolog thing. Uh, let's keep questioning and Pretty soon, we're going to have an ethical society that it will encompass us all. Well, and if you're looking for a place to find that, uh -huh. it's the road to Acapulco. Amen.